society would have us believe that anyone classified as overweight or obese is unhealthy, and that the image of health is everyone who is thin. Both assumptions are entirely false. However, regardless of this insight, you may be surprised to find out that we still universally impose a racially biased, gender biased, and generally flawed maths equation loaded with weight stigma in order to decide the health of people across the entire world. Body mass index, commonly referred to as BMI, is a measure that divides weight by height in order to indicate the health of the person. Seems simple and efficient, right? Well, one would hope that it would be, seeing as we've been using it as our international standard for health since the 1980s. However, we seem to be sweeping some rather crucial and shocking facts under the rug when it comes to BMI. One of them being that the man behind the index, Adolf Quetelé, wasn't even a scientifically accurate person. He was a Belgian mathematician who invented BMI in 1832 with the intention of creating the perfect weight of the average man. And while he used the word average, his study was solely based off of white, cisgendered, white and Scottish men. So that meant that his studies resulted in an index that didn't distinguish between sexes, ethnicity, and completely disregards muscle mass. What is meant by this is that in using BMI in order to determine whether someone is of a healthy weight, the presence of muscle mass is not taken into consideration. This seems to make zero sense, especially when we consider the fact that muscle mass weighs more than fat, and therefore someone with strong bones and good muscle tone may be considered obese or overweight according to BMI. With regards to distinguishing between sexes, we currently use the same index to determine people's health, even though the proportions between fat, muscle, and bone are differently distributed between male and female bodies. As well as this, as previously stated, the index is solely based on a portion of white and European men, as Quetelet saw this average as the ideal. Therefore, seeing that research has shown that people of different ethnicities tend to have different body compositions, we shouldn't be using a racially biased index as an international standard. If these insights are not enough to convince you that BMI is an inadequate measure of health, it might interest you to know that in 1998, the threshold of BMI for normal bodies was lowered from 27.8 to 25. And this was justified by the National Institutes of Health because they claimed that a round number like 25 would be easier to remember. Essentially, this meant that the amount of Americans considered obese according to BMI had doubled overnight with 29 million Americans waking up unhealthy. Thus, BMI is not only scientifically inaccurate, but is also arbitrary. However, one of the most worrying issues with BMI is that it enforces the false notion that at a certain size we can become suddenly unhealthy. And this messaging is frankly false. A study conducted in the United States revealed that out of 47% of people classified as obese according to BMI, only 4% were actually unhealthy. To further put this into perspective, within the US population, roughly 75 million adults were misclassified as healthy <laughs> or unhealthy based off of BMI below. Figures such as these are extremely worrying, as the amount of false information being spread regarding the association between weight, health, and BMI is resulting in an ever-increasing sense of shame surrounding the way we feel about our bodies. And what further perpetuates this is that not only are we using BMI in our healthcare systems, but we are using it here in our schools. Currently, the NHS's National Child Measurement Program measures the weight and height and calculates the BMI of children in reception, aged four to five, and in year six, aged 10 to 11. What this leads to is an increased stigmatization of obesity, as labeling a child as overweight just further perpetuates the stigma associated with being fat and leads children with being afraid to being fat, not because of their health risks, but because of the early awareness that having a fat body is socially unacceptable in our society. What is especially concerning about this is that BMI screenings in school undoubtedly increase the social pressure on children to achieve the perfect body. And those labelled as overweight by BMI may be motivated to take desperate action to reduce their weight, leading to an increase in disordered eating. Such claims are supported by a study that found that children as young as five have already absorbed our cultural bias against fat people. Now, this does not mean that I disagree that we should be aiming to encourage healthy behaviours in young children. But there are alternative methods of keeping children healthy rather than weight checking them and instilling negative thoughts about their own bodies and their weight. I distinctly remember being in my year six physics lesson when my teacher brought out a box of weighing scales and told us that in today's lesson, we would be measuring each other's BMIs. 
As a kid who was always self-conscious about their body, there was nothing I wanted less than for my classmates to record my weight and height and tell me I was overweight, only for them having to record that feedback and feedback it to the entire class. Now, while if only I had known how meaningless this index was, maybe I would have been able to tell myself it wasn't important. But alas, these things stick with you and they can lead to years of self-hatred. And this is why BMI needs to be stopped in its tracks. As well as this, Outside the sphere of schools, BMI has been causing problems in our healthcare systems for years. The disappointing fact is that healthcare professionals' negative feelings about fat bodies can often lead to misdiagnoses that negatively impact patient outcomes. Alongside this, patients who face or anticipate facing fat phobia with their doctors may seek medical care less often, and when they do, be less likely to comply with doctors' orders. In order to properly illustrate this problem, I would like to read out some first-hand testimonies regarding weight bias in healthcare. One woman writes, a patient of mine once went to urgent care, short of breath, only to be told it was because she had too much fat on her chest. Later, at the emergency room, they discovered she had a pulmonary embolism and needed coagulants. Another example is that of Ellen Maud Bennett, who died of inoperable cancer after seeking years of medical help and constantly being shunned aside, told to simply lose weight. Doctors deny fat patients' pain or minimize their pain management because some doctors believe that some bodies, namely fat bodies, deserve the pain they're in. Now, for some of you that may argue that this response is unjustified, I would like to draw your attention to a 2019 study that surveyed 400 Canadians on their physici on physicians on their attitudes regarding obesity. Of those physicians, 18% agreed with the statement, I am disgusted treating patients with obesity. Although this is a minority of the sample, the result remains alarming. How many patients are being negatively impacted by these attitudes? And what does that attitude do to a patient's experience of healthcare? Ultimately, the fact that higher weight patients can be treated completely differently based off of a false index such as BMI is shocking, appalling, and needs to change. So at this juncture of my talk, you may be wondering what the point is. Am I just incessantly complaining about BMI or am I actually going to present you with some alternatives? Well, yes, I am. And the main alternative I would like to talk to you about today is HAYS, or Health at Every Size. The definition of the Health at Every Size movement is an approach to public health that seeks to de-emphasize weight loss as a health goal and reduce stigma towards people who are currently labeled by BMI as overweight or obese. Instead, what HAYS seeks to emphasize is that health is a result of lifestyle behaviors that can be performed independently of body weight. HAYS outlines five key principles. The first being weight inclusivity, meaning that we are to accept and respect the inherent diversity of body shapes and sizes and reject idealizing or pathologizing of certain weights. Secondly, health enhancement, which holds that we should be paying attention to one's physical, mental, and economic health. Thirdly, respectful care, which ultimately means advocating for weight inclusivity and fighting weight stigma. The fourth principle is eating for well-being, which promotes becoming an intuitive eater by getting rid of diet culture food rules. And finally, life-enhancing movement, meaning becoming involved in forms of exercise and movement that makes one feel good. Ultimately, what Hayes is saying is that we are far too diverse to be able to simplify one weight recommendation for everyone. Two people can eat the exact same thing, exercise the exact same amount, and still have different body shapes and sizes. Now, one of the biggest criticisms of Hayes is, does it promote obesity? The simple answer is no. What Hayes does promote is the concept that we have different genetics and therefore different blueprints for what our bodies look like when given adequate care. So instead of measuring what weight by health, Hayes measures health by behaviors. However, while Hayes is a great alternative to BMI, one of the main things we need to be doing is considering our own beliefs about weight. For example, why are we afraid of the word fat? We all live in a culture that teaches us to fear fat and think that fat is bad, and that is in some way or another going to influence us. We need to be educating people on the multifactorial causes of obesity in order to combat the atmosphere of victim blaming that we have been nurturing. The stereotypical messaging around obesity solely being caused by patients being lazy or lacking in self-discipline is something that we need to challenge, and this starts with getting rid of BMI. Although obesity is indeed a risk factor for several diseases, and we should rightly aim to reduce it, the stigma around obesity does not make obese people healthier. Instead, it increases individuals' risk of depression, suicide, and eating disorders. In simpler terms, 
Fat shaming through BMI does not work as a weight loss tool. To sum up, I encourage you to challenge and reframe your own beliefs and preconceptions regarding weight and acknowledge your own weight bias. Together, we need to push for a better world which dismantles flawed indexes such as BMI and instead makes waves in healthcare, schools and our general society through different approaches which results in a positive environment for us all, no matter what we look like. Thank you.